So, since 2000, the world has been hit with more than 1,700 earthquakes with magnitude greater than 5. Many happened around the Ring of Fire, located around the Pacific Ocean. In North America, the biggest threat is the San Andreas Fault Line, which can create an earthquake of a magnitude higher than any other, earning it the spine-tingling nickname, the Big One. The potential destruction of California is a terrifying prospect that could have unimaginable consequences. But the big one is just the beginning of what's to come. Bad news! Scientists have predicted an earth-shattering event that will occur in 2030. Like it or not, there's a 70% chance that we'll experience the big one, and it will be an earthquake with a magnitude of 6.7. The San Andreas fault line will cause the big one, but what is scary is that we can't predict it. On the other hand, a massive earthquake occurs every 100 years. This means there's always time to prepare for a natural disaster. If we traveled back in time, we'd see a few significant earthquakes like the ones that wiped out San Francisco and Fort Tejon. Buildings made a long time ago are not quake-proof. They will collapse. Even if they survive, you should not enter them. But buildings are not the most dangerous part. You should watch out for electrical lines and gas pipes. Your hill house might be lovely, but it is extremely unsafe. During quakes, the hill can turn into a massive landslide that will destroy everything in its path. Say goodbye to road trips, because all the roads will be ruined. You should have some spare water and food, since you won't be able to go to the supermarket. This disaster won't be cheap. It will cost the US around $200 billion to recover from the quake. At least, the earthquake will not trigger tsunamis. But there's something it can cause more damage than the big one. The notorious Cascadia subduction zones start in California and ends up all the way in Vancouver, Canada. The San Andreas fault line is nothing compared to this zone. It can wipe the whole coast off the face of the Earth, an example of hyperbole. Subduction zones are tectonic plates forced to be one under the other and constantly pulling apart. One is called the North American plate and the other is the Juan de Fuca plate. Zones like these are not to be messed with since they are terrifying hotspots for earthquake activity and extremely dangerous because they cause massive underwater quakes. But they are underwater, so what can they do to us? Well, they can cause giant tsunamis, flooding cities, and destroying the coastline. Right now, the most active zone is the Ring of Fire. The Cascadia zone might be less active, but it is like a sleeping beast that can wake up and destroy everything in its path, causing a groundbreaking earthquake. The last time all this stress was released was in the year 1700. Unlike the San Andreas quake, this one will cause massive tsunamis and much bigger shocks. Let's hope you'll be camping in an open field at that time, because most buildings and bridges will likely be destroyed. Also, be ready for the aftershocks, as they'll be devastating. Nature won't be spared either. Landslides will change animals' habitats. Even our homes will be changed forever. Luckily, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and scientists are doing everything they can to ensure our safety. New rules are implemented. Every new building must be able to withstand massive shocks. They're developing modern warning systems, and every new infrastructure must follow strict quick-proof guidelines. The Juan de Fuca and the North American plates are locked together, but they won't stay like that forever. When they unlock, get ready for a massive shake. The closer you are to the epicenter, the more damage you'll experience. But even if you are lucky to be far away, you may still feel the ground shaking for some time. Now, if we compare the Cascadia subduction zone and the San Andreas Fault, we'll see how much more dangerous the Cascadia zone is. In 1994, there was an enormous 6.7 magnitude earthquake in the Northridge area, close to the San Andreas Fault. Sadly, many people didn't make it, and some were injured. Back then, buildings were not strong and earthquake-proof, and many of them were damaged. The Cascadia subduction zone can potentially cause a magnitude 9 earthquake. A magnitude 6 quake has the power of around 44 million pounds of dynamite. But a magnitude 9 has the power of 44 trillion pounds of dynamite. The strongest ever recorded quake was in Chile. Its magnitude measured 9.5, and it destroyed most everything. So let's say you've survived the quake, but the struggle is far from over. 
Soon after, a massive tsunami will strike, with waves that might reach up to 100 feet in some areas. That's so unlike the San Andreas earthquake, which can't produce any significant waves. So say goodbye to your beautiful garden, since salt water will destroy trees and plants, changing the environment for a period of time. The only positive thing will be you won't need Halloween decorations, because all those dried-out trees will resemble a ghost forest. The combination of waves, quakes, and the sheer size of the area will make this natural disaster much more dangerous than any caused by the San Andreas Fault or the so-called Big One. A quake similar to this happened around 300 years ago. Many more have been recorded in the past 3,500 years, proving that they continually occur every 4 to 600 years. So, technically, we have around 100 to 300 years before the next big one hits. We still have no idea how exactly the Cascadia subduction zone works, because we discovered it in 1970. This zone is super scary because it can cause big earthquakes. It was found by accident when researchers studied the Ring of Fire. They wanted to know if this area had caused any trouble in the past years, and the proof was under their noses. In Washington, there is a horror forest where nothing has been growing for years. When researchers tested the soil, they found a tremendous amount of salt. They put two and two together and concluded that a massive tsunami had been the reason. Experts still didn't know when the forest was destroyed. But Japan kept records of a gigantic earthquake that had a similar effect. It was the one that happened in the year 1700. There is a 1 in 3 chance that the next one will occur in 2050. You must know how to survive the Canadian earthquakes and make it out unscathed. So listen carefully. Those who live in this area have almost no experience with earthquakes like this one. Surviving the quake is relatively easy, but the tsunami coming afterwards is the real danger. After the shake, find the highest ground and go there. Only bring the essentials, like food and water. Yeah, leave your baseball card collection at home. After the first hit, don't try to go down. Seismologists say that most likely there will be a few more waves, and they have proven this. On the 22nd of May 1960, seismologist Jerry Esten and his four friends went to Hawaii to see an expected tsunami that was to happen around midnight. They set up their gear on Wailuku Bridge with an escape route planned. This bridge had been destroyed in the previous tsunami, but the new one was much taller and better. After midnight, the water was 4 feet above the average level. The second wave hit a half hour after midnight, and the water rose another 9 feet by 1 a.m. The water started going down and dropped by 7 feet, but the horror was far from over. Next, they saw a wave that was around 20 feet tall. This shows us that tsunamis are unpredictable, and we should listen to experts to stay safe. There is a powerful force hiding underground where tectonic plates meet, and one forces another under it. This happens in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Strain builds over centuries. The tension is unbearable until the megathrust awakens. The Earth shakes with a magnitude that can exceed 9 points, more powerful than any other earthquake. When the seafloor suddenly gets pushed up fast, it sends a huge ripple across the water and a tsunami of huge force is out. These waves are called telesunamis, and they cross entire ocean basins, ready to take over coastlines thousands of miles away. The thrust fault stretches over 600 miles. The Earth is not just shaking, it feels like it's tearing apart. This is the power of a megathrust earthquake. Those caught in its path will have to fight for their lives. Japanese authorities recently had to issue their first ever megaquake advisory. It happened because of a strong tremor on the edge of the Nankai Trough ocean floor zone. In the end, most of the warnings were lifted and there wasn't much damage from the 7.1 magnitude earthquake. Parts of southwestern Japan started to shake, and the superfast trains in Japan slowed down to stay safe, which made travel slower for everyone. But everyone is staying alert, as they know about the risk of a megathrust earthquake that could happen within the next few decades in the Nankai Trough. The tectonic plate under the Philippine Sea is slowly sliding underneath the land where Japan is moving just a few inches every year. 
The last big earthquakes from this area happened in 1944 and 1946, both with a magnitude of 8.1. These quakes have caused a lot of destruction in the country. The next megathrust earthquake in the region, if it does happen, could be between a magnitude 8 and 9. Scientists still can't agree on how likely this mega-earthquake is to happen, but it could be up to 80% certainty. On the other side of the Pacific, scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey have studied a dangerous area along the U.S. west coast. It's called the Cascadia Subduction Zone, and it stretches from Northern California to Northern Vancouver Island in Canada. Over the past 14,200 years, there have likely been at least 30 big earthquakes in this region. One major quake happens every 500 years on average. But for a long time now, Cascadia has been quiet, and it worries scientists. They think this might be because the area is locked, meaning the tectonic plates are stuck together and building up a lot of pressure. Eventually, the part of the seafloor could suddenly break and move by several feet. The shaking would be just five minutes, but it would create a powerful tsunami as the seafloor shifts that would last for 10 hours. If it happens, it's going to be the worst natural disaster in the country's history, according to experts. The ground on some inland hills could turn into something like quicksand. This would cause the hillsides to slide and crumble, taking down roads and bridges. Around 620,000 buildings could be badly damaged or even collapse including about 100 hospitals and 2,000 schools. People in Washington state might have to take care of themselves without help for two weeks, finding food, water, and shelter on their own. Scientists are studying slow-slip events, where the tectonic plates move very slowly over weeks or months, releasing some energy, but not enough to stop a big one. Every time the magnitude of an earthquake goes up by just one number, the energy it releases is 40 times bigger. So we'd need about a million small earthquakes every day for 500 years straight to release the same energy as one huge magnitude 9 earthquake. But these small earthquakes might be clues that a bigger earthquake is coming. To better monitor the Cascadia Fault, experts are mapping the fault more accurately and adding better monitoring tools offshore. Scientists receive over $10 million to install seismic sensors and seafloor pressure gauges on a fiber-optic cable off the coast of Oregon. The goal is to be ready to warn people and potentially save lives when a big earthquake strikes. A sharp megathrust earthquake happened in this part of the world in 1964. It went down in history as the Great Alaska Earthquake and had a magnitude of 9.2. It lasted for more than four minutes, making it the most powerful earthquake in the history of the U.S. and North America. The ground shook so hard that it caused huge cracks and landslides. In Anchorage, many houses, buildings, and roads were destroyed because they weren't built to handle such a big earthquake. In some places, the land was permanently changed. For example, the coastline near Kodiak and Hinchinbrook Island was lifted by 30 feet. In other areas, like Gerwood and Portage, the ground sank by 8 feet. They had to rebuild roads higher so they wouldn't be flooded by the time. A huge 27-foot tsunami wiped out the entire village of Chiniga. Many coastal towns were heavily damaged, not just by the earthquake, but also by tsunamis and the fires that followed. After the main earthquake, there were thousands of smaller aftershocks for months. A moderate earthquake of magnitude 4.4 shook Los Angeles in August 2024. Once it was over, the LA Fire Department checked around the city and didn't find any major damage or anyone hurt. In the nearby city of Pasadena, which is close to the earthquake's epicenter, a water pipe burst inside City Hall and everyone had to leave the building. Thankfully, there was no danger of a tsunami. The best we can do to avoid panic in such situations is to be prepared. Japan is one of the places on Earth where earthquakes happen the most because it sits on the edges of four tectonic plates. Around 1,500 of these earthquakes each year are noticeable. Because of this, the people in Japan have learned to live with earthquakes. The 1950 law set a rule 
that buildings should be able to handle earthquakes up to a magnitude 7 without falling apart. An update 30 years later said that buildings should only have minor damage in such earthquakes and still work as usual. But if an earthquake is even stronger, the law says the building's main job is to not collapse and save people's lives. At the most basic level, buildings are made stronger with thicker beams, pillars, and walls so they can handle shaking better. Another technique is placing special pads made from materials like rubber at the base of a building. Some buildings are even built on thick layers of padding that separate them from the ground completely, which helps protect them during an earthquake. A skyscraper might sway back and forth a lot, moving up to 5 feet. To stop it from getting damaged, engineers can add something called dampers every second floor all the way to the top. These dampers are like giant bicycle pumps, but instead of air, they're filled with liquid. When the building shakes, the dampers push against the liquid inside them. Even though the liquid doesn't squish very much, it can still absorb some of the shaking. When they're building tall skyscrapers, engineers try to make the structure as simple and balanced as possible. This means having each floor the same height and placing the support columns evenly. But sometimes, architects who design skyscrapers don't want to make these compromises because they have creative ideas for how the building should look. Then they have to find compromise solutions. For example, Tokyo's Skytree Tower, one of the tallest buildings in the world, is designed in a futuristic style but also includes special features to protect it from earthquakes. It has a central pillar, like in traditional Japanese pagodas, and seismic dampers that help absorb the energy from an earthquake, keeping the building safe. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.